with you. With your spirit. May the word of God be on our mind, our lips, and in our heart. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When I was a little kid, a few years ago, I uh, used to come home and the first thing I used to try to hear was my mother's voice. And when I heard my mother's voice, then I was okay, took the cookies, went out and played softball or whatever, football, whatever it was. But I need to hear her voice to have that sense of security. Today, lives are a little different. The mother gets on a cell phone at work, and she calls and sees if the son is home. And when she hears his voice, she has a sense of security. So the child, as they're growing up, needs the mother's voice to have that sense of security. And then they have a little security blanket. And the security blanket really is the mother's voice. And the child's voice is the security blanket for the mother. And as for someday, <coughs> some days I put a prayer shawl around my shoulder that someone made for me. And when I have that prayer shawl around me, I have a sense of security of warmth, and I become aware of God's presence while I'm sitting in my prayer corner. Yes, whether it's a mother's voice, a child's voice, a security blanket, or, or a prayer shawl, all of them really symbolize one person, the Good Shepherd. And you know the word good means ideal. Yes, he is our ideal security. Of all the securities we have in the world, the Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who knows us, who knows our voice, who is identified with our voice, is, has, and will be our security. And all of us are on a journey, a journey through life. Many times we'll heal bumps in the road. We know there will be bumps in the road, sickness, unemployment, all kinds of family problems. Those bumps are there. And but Jesus is along that journey with all the bumps in the road because he's going to lead us, the sheep, and towards our final destination, our final goal, which is eternal life. That begins on earth and is culminating in heaven. Yes, the Good Shepherd knows us. He knows our voice. And he uses our voice to honor our Heavenly Father. When you and I just began to sing in the opening song, and we became one voice, and when it, in that voice, there's a diversity. I'm flat and you're not flat. Your voices are strong, other voices are weak. But whatever diversity we have in singing, it becomes one voice. It becomes Jesus' voice honoring our Heavenly Father. And when Jesus says, I know your, your voice, because your voice becomes my voice in the celebration of the Eucharist. And to become aware of the fact that your voice is Christ's voice. It hits me very strongly whenever we come to the consecration. When I lift up the bread, I lift up the cup of wine, and I realize it's not my voice. It's Christ's voice that's changing the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Yes, Jesus knows our voice as the Good Shepherd because our voice is his voice. And it's only one voice that's being celebrated at this Eucharist. As a, a diversity of sound, but it is one voice, a diversity of song, but it is only one voice. And in the reading today, we heard about the unlimited number of people who are dressed in a white garment. And the white garment represents victory over death, because we know how things are gonna turn out. And the white garment also re uh, represents the purity of our life that will be the ultimate end of our life. So we will be clothed with a white garment as we were at baptism, where we are clothed with God's life. And at the end, we will be one of those dressed in a white garment, as a sign of victory over death, a sign of purity. Yes, that number is unlimited, but it is also united in one a person, in Christ. There's a diversity, and we see, uh, if you read the uh, Revelation before that, 144,000, and the Jehovah Witnesses claim that's the number of people going to heaven. 
Well, that 144,000 has a symbolic name, meaning. 12 tribes 12, times the 12 apostles is 144 times 1,000 is 144,000. So 1,000 means unlimited number. Then we come to the reading of today. Of unlimited number, those clothed with a white garment, a victory over death and purity. Yes, that number is diversified, but it is one in Christ, through Christ, and with Christ. In the other reading, we have a Barnabas and Paul. They're going out to preach to the Gentiles, the new Christians, and to the Jewish Christians. But there's a diversity there, too, a tremendous diversity. Uh, and there's a diversity of cultures, diversity of backgrounds. And yet they, he brings them in as one in Christ. As this Eucharist makes us one in Christ, so they, Paul and Barnabas, was preaching the Eucharist, that they become one in Christ. Even though there's diversity, there is unity in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ. And yet how were they uh, accepted? By the community, wonderfully, but by those in authority, uh, they were condemned to death. And they had to leave town because they would be killed. Yes, the early Christians, the leaders and the Christians were tremendously um, persecuted. Uh, and when you read, read the Magnificat every day, you read one after another of people who were persecuted because of their faith in Christ. Now what happened 2,000 years ago is happening today. The church continues to be persecuted in many different ways, on the outside and on the inside. We don't have a Barnabas, we don't have a Paul, no, but we have, we have a, a Pope a Francis. Yes, we have leaders today. And we see that the church is being uh, persecuted on the outside and also on the inside. And we saw what, what, uh, the Boston Massacre a few days ago. And uh, the whole purpose of one group of people, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, uh, and the priests of the Old Testament, their one purpose is to destroy Christianity, the Western Hemisphere. And they need a base of destruction. And what is the base of destruction? Not just Chuck Neen, where those two kids came from, but the center of the Middle East. What has the center of the Middle East become? The center, and the, really the pool, and, the, and the, uh, the source of destruction for all of Christianity. Palestine, less than 3% are Christians. Palestine is gone. Those holy places are just going to be uh, museums. They're not going to be led by Christians. 3%. You look at what happened in Iraq. Two and a half million Christians are out of Iraq. Iraq won't have any Christians. Look at Saudi Arabia. If I wore a, a uh, collar and said mass in Saudi Arabia, I'd be imprisoned or even killed. If I try to convert anybody in Iran to Christianity, I'll be imprisoned and killed. It's the Mideast where Barnabas and Paul were preaching right now. 2,000 years ago, that same area has been really the uh, blast off our source of condemnation of Christianity throughout the world. So we see it in uh, a Boston Massacre. Yes, those kids came from Chechnya in, in Russia, but they are united with the terrorists of the Middle East. And their whole purpose was to disrupt our way of life. And our way of life is a Christian way of life, a Judeo-Christian way of life. And what we saw at uh, Boston uh, Massacre, we saw in the year 2000 at 9-11. And now uh, we see it at Newtown in a different way, the violence. And how many have been stopped since to, uh, 2000, 9-11 to the year 2000? Between then and now, there have been many, many, many uh, explosions that were never exploded and they were stopped by FBI or whatever it was. So will this continue on in our lifetime? Yes, it will continue on. It's going to get worse because the influence of anti-Christianity is growing and growing. And on the outside, we're going to have a Boston massacre. We're going to have a 9-11. We're going to have a new town. Yes, it's going to happen. Look at history. We've stopped so many, but they're going to continue to try in the future because their basis is hatred towards the Judeo-Christian concept of life. But that's not the problem of the church. The outside is just one that we see. But the inside of the persecution of the church 
is much, much greater. And the persecution that's going on in the church is the persecution caused by the sin of indifference. That's worse than that Boston Massacre. That killed 300, uh, three rather, or four, and, it, and hurt all less than 200. But 30 million have given it indifference in the church. I don't care about the church. And that kind of destruction is much more devastating uh, than a pressure cooker bomb that blew up in Boston. Yes, we asked you, I mean, you come up to have your uh, hands uh, head anointed if, if for the sick. If there's any reason why you should receive the sacrament of the sick, and you say amen to it. Amen, which means yes, I truly believe. You don't say thank you because it's not a religious response. The only thing you say is yes, it truly is Jesus with your amen. At Holy Communion, when you put out your hand as, as a, a plate to receive Jesus or directly in the mouth, or when you come up and put out your hand again to receive the blessing of Jesus, and you say amen, you have an opportunity to take one of these crosses which says, I love you, Jesus. Uh, Peter Nero let me buy his, or give me his, his billboard on moon night, and I put it up to the sign, I love you, Jesus. And uh, I'm asking you, the greatest uh, persecution of the church is the indifference in your family, your friends, your school, or your labor place, or your place of work. I'm asking you if you wish to take this. It says, I love you, Jesus. It can be taken in two ways. I love you, Jesus, you say. Or Jesus says, I love you, sign Jesus. Give it to someone and let them see the cross where Jesus died for him or for her. And that's a journey along a sign of the, give them the grace to say, the Good Shepherd who rose from the dead is walking along your journey of life. Yes, your journey is going to have bumps, and I'm sure it has, but it also knows the way it's going to end, oh, as dressed in a white garment, as one of the unlimited for eternity. Today is also the celebration of Vocation Sunday, the Good Shepherd. Or we pray for vocations to the priesthood. Now I'll take you out and I'll buy you breakfast this morning. If you would tell me, tell me which, where is the crisis in the Catholic Church today? Where is the greatest need in the Catholic Church today? Is it uh, lack of priests? Uh, I'm 80 years old. I should be retired. But the bishop is very happy that I'm staying on. Because there's no one to take my place. So I'm staying on. Is that the crisis in the church? Is the crisis in the church the lack of nuns? Ten years ago we had 165,000 nuns. Now we have 48,000 nuns, and most of them, three quarters, are over 70. Is that the crisis in the church? Is the crisis in the church that we don't have brothers? Is the crisis in the church that we don't have um, deacons, enough deacons? The crisis in the church we don't have enough lay women or lay single lay women or lay men. No, that's not the crisis of the church. The crisis of the church is the church, and the church is the family. Yes, the crisis of the Catholic Church is our families today. That's where the crisis is. Because from our families come vocations to priesthood. From our families come sisters, come deacons, come brothers, come wonderful single devoted people. Yeah, and from our families come wonderful fa uh, marriages. That's the crisis of the church. Today I we celebrate Vocation Sunday in the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd is our own family. And the voice of the Good Shepherd is your voice. And what does Jesus say? You know it's nice to hear your voice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.